Hi. Um. <laughs> so my name is Nisanthan. I'm a senior software engineer at Sentry on the issue experience team. And welcome to my talk on debugging for WebAssembly. As we all know, WebAssembly is a very powerful tool uh, and fast emerging technology for the browser and beyond. But, however, as with any technology, there's always bugs. So in this talk, I'll be covering the techniques that you would use to deal with those bugs and the technologies that power the tools that will help you solve those bugs. Debugging is core to the developer experience. Roughly 25% of your time is spent squashing bugs. And we as a community should spend time and invest in the tools uh, and tooling around debugging to help us and newcomers to WebAssembly. So basic debugging involves using print line debugging, which is the most basic tool. Essentially, just log out your variables, run the code, and work backwards to figure out what's going wrong. Unit tests are a little bit better, but I'm not going to go into too much detail here, uh, but these are the most basic tools in your tool belt. Before we get into more advanced tools, I want to talk about the tech that powers those tools. So I'm going to dive deep into Dwarf and source maps. Dwarf is a debugging format uh, that's commonly used in low-level programming languages like C and C++. Dwarf works, for, works by embedding sections of debug, debug data in an executable or object file. And because WASM is an extensible object format, it's totally possible to embed the Dwarf data. So this, de this debug data includes function names, file names, and line numbers, so which we can use to pinpoint issues in the code. However, there are some limitations because not all compilers support it, and this debug data can be quite large. To address these limitations, WebAssembly also supports source maps. And you may be familiar with source maps if you ever work with JavaScript. But for those of you who are unfamiliar, source maps provide a way to uh, map compiled code back to the original source code by using like a file. And this file contains like line numbers, file numbers, and we can just use it to map like inverse relationship. And how do you use source maps and Dwarf to debug WebAssembly? The best supported tool is going to be the browser dev tools, uh, which have support for debugging WebAssembly using those formats. So for example, in Chrome dev tools, you can view the source code of your WebAssembly module, set breakpoints, and step through the code uh, just like you would with traditional JavaScript. And to do this, you would need to enable Dwarf support in your browser. And uh, allow us to pause on caught exceptions. And when you have an error or a breakpoint, by default, it stops on the JavaScript glue code. But on the right, you can see the call stack representing the stack trace of the error. And you can navigate to the original source code and the line that invoked the exception. Now, if you look in the scope view, you can see the original names and values of the variables in code. Now that we've covered the basics of debugging WebAssembly using the browser dev tools, I want to dive into some more advanced uh, tooling. So WAP stands for the WebAssembly Binary Toolkit. It's a powerful tool set when working with WebAssembly. So it includes, uh, like its suite of tools includes a disassembler, a validator, and a debugger. So it's pretty useful when you're trying to debug WebAssembly. And so I want to go into an example of how we can debug issues with compiled WebAssembly when we don't have access to the source code. So I built this uh, small application that returns the Fibonacci sequence. The calculation is offloaded to a WASM function uh, that we don't have the source to. And this demo is running in an iframe, so on my local host. But as we can see here, the moment we hit 21, it's returning a zero, right? So something's going wrong. So the first thing we can do is use the WASM decompile tool to decompile the WASM module. Uh, 
into a readable C-like um, syntax. It's not C code, but the result will let you read large volumes of code um, when you don't have access to the source of the WASM binary. And so looking closer at the output, does anything look suspicious? Probably this line, where if A is greater than 20, it's returning a zero. So the next thing we can do is also use the WASM interp interpreter to run our unit tests or pass arguments to WASM functions. So this would allow you to pinpoint the exact location of the performance issue and identify any bugs that might be causing them. And here, you can just run it, and you can see, like, oh, it's actually the Fibonacci function here that's causing the problem. So after identifying the problem, uh, you can run the wasm to wat tool to translate the binary uh, file format into the text format. And now we can edit the watt file. So when we open up the release watt file, it looks like this. And as we, like looking at that, this is where the suspicious code lies. And if we just delete it and edit out a little bit more, uh, we can generate the binary from that text format using the watt to wasm tool, import the modified library, and run it. And hopefully this works. Yeah. Oh, no? Oh. Oh, I got to click this thing. Oh, nice. OK, so it's working. Oh, I guess you guys didn't see the other one. Oh, whatever. Uh, OK. Another interesting problem is when our code has a memory leak. So when a WebAssembly module is instantiated, the JavaScript engine internally creates an array buffer. Uh, the array buffer is a JavaScript object that JavaScript has a reference to and allows us to pass values between JavaScript and WebAssembly. If a WebAssembly module has instance to the direct memory and forgets to clear out that memory before it goes out of scope, then the browser can leak memory. And so once the array buffer size is greater than the browser's uh, limit, then it's going to crash. So the first thing to do is to verify the issue. So we can use the browser's profiling dev tool to get a heap dump. And if you look at the bottom left, you can see a graph of the heap dump. And the line goes up and to the right, so indicating that there's probably a leak here. After you've identified the, to identify where the leak is, you can use the memory inspector uh, in your browser's dev tools to inspect the contents of the array buffer uh, at a breakpoint and see what's causing the problem. OK, at this point, we've talked a lot about uh, how to debug issues on our local machine. And I think we have a, like our code in a good state. So we should be thinking about how we're going to get ready to deploy. And we'll need to generate a release binary and monitor the release for errors. But, before, but let's go back to Dwarf. If you recall, the Dwarf debug data is embedded right in the WASM binary. And it's a problem for two reasons. It, it allows most, like, it'll allow you to easily decompile your code, and most people won't want that. And it, even if you're a big fan of open source, uh, this debug data is quite big. It's going to be like an order of magnitude larger than the actual binary. And you can split out the WASM file into the code and debug data. Uh, it's totally possible. The debug data can live in a non-executable, non-functional WASM file that only contains the debug information. The problem is that after splitting out those two things, it's difficult to put them back together or like link them. You know. An idea popularized by both Apple and Microsoft was giving debug uh, and executable files globally unique debug IDs. And with that ID, you can link the debug file and the binary together. This proposal was raised by a Sentry team member, actually, Armin, and was just merged in three weeks ago. And Sentry has built some tooling around this like three years ago. But first, what's Sentry? I know a couple of you in the room use Sentry, but for those of you who don't, um, it's an error monitoring, application performance monitoring, and session replay tool. It's open source. It's really easy to self-host. You can spin up a VM and run the install script. Super easy. Uh, and we have SDKs for lots of languages, including WASM. Uh, 
So the tool that Sentry builds uh, will split out the dwarf information uh, into a separate file and strip it from the WASM, uh, like from your release file. So generating two files, right? Like your debug file and the actual release binary. The tool will also add in a custom header called build ID into the WASM files with the UUID. And you're left with, uh, and this header you can use to link those two files together. So as part of your CI CD pipeline, you're gonna wanna upload that, uh, those debug files from WASM split and the source maps. And then Sentry is able to uh, enrich the captured exceptions um, from production. And once we deploy our application, we're gonna wanna monitor those exceptions that our users face and then resolve them using the tools that we just discussed. Thanks for listening to my talk. Any questions? Thanks for the talk. Yeah. Um, my question is, that seemed very WASM browser-centric. Did I kind of get that wrong? Um, what about doing some debugging of non-browser web assembly applications? So you can use the WebAssembly binary toolkit uh, for that. So the interpreter works with the binary like that you'd use on like WASM time, stuff like that, or like the WASI runtime. Uh, yeah, like that portion is probably like your best bet right now. Uh, but the most well-supported tooling is for the browser, because that makes sense, because that's where it originally started, right? Uh, but yeah, the tooling is pretty lacking uh, for server-side. But once you capture exceptions in Sentry, we actually show you the stack trace and all that stuff. So it's actually pretty decent, like at least on our side, yeah. Anything else? Cool. All right. Okay, thank you. Yep. <laughs>